All right, hello and welcome to another Expert Inside interview. My name is John Golden from Sales Pop, online sales magazine and Pipeliner CRM. Joining you as usual from the sunny San Diego. And today I'm delighted to be joined from the other coast of the country, Leslie Zane, who is in New York, in New York State. How are you doing, Leslie? It's great to see you, John, and nice to meet you and your audience. Yeah, and Leslie is an award-winning marketer, TEDx speaker, and authority in harnessing the instinctive mind to accelerate brand and business growth. Founder and CEO of Triggers, the first brand consulting firm rooted in behavioral science. You champion the primacy of instinct, the instinctive mind in brand decisions, and you are the author of the book, The Power of Instinct, if you want to hold that up for the audience. Great. The New Rules of Persuasion in Business and Life. And you have pioneered the brand Connect Home and Growth Triggers, helping define today's understanding of human decision making. And, and that's what we want to talk about today is, is this, this power of instinct. Because like you said, is uh, marketing is, is built on conscious triggers, right? And you're saying, hang on, the in instinct is what plays a greater role. So just explain explain the whole uh, science behind this, or just before we get dive into the into the the meat. Absolutely. Well, first of all, thanks so much for having me. It's great fun to be here. Um. So look, the whole world of marketing is focused on trying to persuade people to do what we want them to do. And very often they don't listen. <laughs> they don't do what they want us, what we want them to do. Uh, and you know that from the most mm -hmm. recent conversation you had at a, with a relative over Thanksgiving, right? Like you can give people all these facts about politics. They're not going to change their minds. No. Um, so what we want to understand is really that the brain has two mechanisms the conscious mind and the unconscious mind. There's really only one mind, let's face it. But we have these two different mechanisms and they operate very differently. And today's marketing is still trying to persuade the conscious mind to do what we want it to do. And it doesn't listen because it's basically a brick wall. Mm. The conscious mind is, is skeptical. It's resistant to change. People think they know best. Um, and so what we've learned is that rather than keeping on, you know, taking the slow road uh, to our goals, we can actually leverage the instinct of mind, which it turns out is far more malleable. Mm -hmm. And ideas can sink in there and you can get your story out and you can get your branding out and your marketing out um, much more easily. And it actually sinks into people's memories through the instinctive mind much faster and more efficiently than going up against that that brick wall. Yeah. But it's interesting, isn't it? I mean, especially uh, you know, with technology, with so much data and everything, is that we have, in many ways, we have kind of uh, pushed the whole instinctive part down and sort of said, oh, you know, instinct. No, I need hard data. I need, I need, I need metrics. I need technology, and and so. Um, so just tell me why why that's not the correct approach and yours is. So what what is what are we missing by by reducing the uh, reliance on instinct over I, I guess practic, prag, what people would call pragmatic metrics? Well, I, I love that question. Um, I would say that our data is becoming delinked from the human beings that it that it stems from. And that human element is really how we decide. It is the, the instinctive brain, the implicit mind that is making 95% of the decisions that we make. But we're all focused on that top, the top portion of that sort of iceberg. If you think of the, the mind mm -hmm. as an iceberg with the conscious brain above the waterline and the unconscious mind below the waterline, what I'm saying is, you're basically spending 100% of your resources on only 5% of the decisions that we make as human beings. And our brand decisions, our, our choices, whether it's in B2B, B2C, I don't care. It doesn't matter. We've seen the same thing across categories. It is the instinctive mind that's calling the shots. And so that's where we need to concentrate our attention. That's what we need to understand. All that data is great. 
but it's 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 a it's only part of the story. Mm -hmm. Your story is actually incomplete if you don't focus on on really what's underneath the waterline, that hidden brain. So what would you say to uh, sales and marketing leaders who might be listening to this and saying, you know, well, we're doing everything according to, you know, conventional, conventional wisdom here around our marketing. What should we do to start pivoting to what you're talking about? Well, so when you think about it, the rules of marketing were written, I don't know, 50, 60 years ago, right? Maybe even a little mm -hmm. bit longer when we thought that it was the conscious mind that made all of our decisions. But now we know that's not correct. Now neuroscience and behavioral science have taught us that it is the unconscious mind that is actually driving people's choices. So in my view, we need a new set of rules to displace the old traditional rules. And that's actually what my book is mm -hmm. about. There's literally 10 new rules. I take down one marketing rule after the other. And, and remember, I, I've been work, working with Fortune 500 companies my entire life. So it's not like they're, they're not using these techniques. It's not like this is going to be some sure. aberrant thing that doesn't work for your organization. We're, we're, what we're doing is we're sort of giving people the keys to unlock that instinctive mind so they can drive change, drive their brands faster and, and more efficiently. Mm -hmm. Well, let's talk about a couple of them. Uh, give me one that you think is, is probably the entree into this. Okay, love that. All right, this is one of my favorites. As soon as you become a marketer, one of the first, thing that, first things that you're taught is that you'd better be unique. Stand out, be the purple cow, differentiate or die. Mm -hmm. Like, right? Like that is what it's all about. Well, hang on a minute. The human brain is hardwired to connect with the familiar. We actually reject the unique. I mean, that's why nine out of 10 new products fail. That think about a baby. If you take a baby out of its mother's arms, it's going to start to scream because mm -hmm. it recognizes its mother's familiar face. And now you're giving it a strange face to look at. Or think about the pandemic. People didn't focus on the new brands. They grabbed all of those existing legacy brands that they knew and loved and made them feel secure and comfortable. That's what we are naturally inclined to connect with. And so, um, what we want to understand is, and I know this is going to sound like heresy, mm -hmm. but familiarity is more powerful than uniqueness. Mm -hmm. But now you don't want to be generic. So yeah. what do you do? So you take that familiar thing that everybody knows and you put your own distinctive twist on it and make it your own. Why that works so well is that now you're riding existing neural pathways that already exist in the mind. You're not creating something foreign that's going to be rejected, but you're co-opting it to be linked with your brand. So mm. the new rule is distinctiveness is more powerful than uniqueness. I'm sorry, um, familiarity is more powerful than uniqueness and distinctiveness is best of all. Yeah, no, that's that, that that's fascinating uh, because, like you said, I mean, everybody, you know, the conventional wisdom again is like try to be disruptive, try to stand out, try to look unique. We live in a commoditized world where pretty much everything is commoditized now, so you try and go out of left field. And yeah, I do see, I see a lot of brands struggling with this. Where, it, and it comes, I guess, the thing, Leslie, is it comes off kind of uh, inauthentic, if you like, very manufactured. A hundred, a hundred percent. I mean, um, this is the sort of, it's the, it's the creative inclination that I need to create something completely new mm -hmm. that the world has never seen before. Like that is, that is the mentality. And what we don't realize when we do that is that we're literally fighting the human brain. We're, we're, we're going up against the instinctive mind instead of actually leveraging it. And that's what this is all about. This is about taking the path of least resistance to a sale instead of the path of greatest resistance where mm. all this friction exists. Right, no, absolutely. So what's another one that you would like to highlight? I have a lot of them. Yeah, no, I know, it's fascinating. <laughs> No, this is what I this is to be honest, this is what I love about doing this is because I get a chance to listen to experts like you and learn. 
Awesome. Awesome. Well, you're asking great questions and it's a pleasure to chat with you. Um, okay. So another common rule, again, this is one that you're learn, you, you learn the minute you become a marketer and you get your training, um, is that we only want the brand to stand for one thing. Mm. Okay. So if you're Volvo, you should stand for safety. Um, and if you were, let's say a famous, um, if you were a famous musical um, artist, uh, and you had one sound, a, a country music mm -hmm. sound, um, you would never want to stray into other types of music because your audience might not like that. They might not enjoy your new sound. Mm -hmm. You wouldn't want to turn off your current audience. So the conventional wisdom would have you very much staying in your lane and never deviate. But that's not what Taylor Swift did. What Taylor Swift did was she expanded from country music to dance music to pop to folk music. She's done a little bit of everything, sort of following her own artistic um, interest mm -hmm. and curiosity. And every single time she creates that new type of music, she's creating another pathway and another connection in our minds. And, and so, and, and another example of that is just how she creates both sort of a professional as well as a personal uh, connection to us. Um, you know, it's almost like we, we think we know her. We think that she's our friend. Uh, and so when you think about really what makes a successful brand, you want to have the most connections and the most associations you possibly can. Because if Volvo only stands for safety, mm -hmm. you're going to basically be invisible in the mind. <laughs> because a brand is known by the associations it keeps. And the more associations it has, the better. Yeah. No, I, I'm, I'm, no, that's, that's, again, that's fascinating because, yeah, you do think about Volvo. I mean, you don't normally say, Ooh, I saw a really cool Volvo today. Uh, or like, Oh, I'm really excited. I got this cool Volvo. You're more likely to say, like, I got this Volvo and look at all these features and safety features and how, how reliable and all it is. Um, so then, so when, when a brand tries to stand, uh, to have more than one attribute or stand for more than one thing, what, what happens in the mind? It's a beautiful thing. The brand connectome, and I'll define that in a mm -hmm. moment, grows. So it turns out if you're not growing as a brand, you're dying. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, honestly, it's true about brands and it's true about people. Um, so that you want to have as many connections as possible. And if you're not constantly creating new connections, you're basically remaining stagnant. Right. So let me introduce you to the brand connectome, which is a central um concept and a central tool in our work. And this is what's just over your shoulder there in the background. It is. It okay. is. That's a three-dimensional representation of what a brand looks like in the mind. Hmm. So think of a brand as a central node. That's that hub in the middle. And what's sort of glued to the brand are all these pathways that have formed over time. And what sits on those pathways are positive and negative associations. And, and it's basically cumulative memories some going as far back as childhood. If you're McDonald's or Coca-Cola or or Pepsi, um, those are brands. Those are brand memories that have gotten connected to the brand over time. Turns out you can examine that. You can look at those positive and negative associations, um, which is what we do in our work, and you can actually represent the brand in and what it looks like in people's unconscious minds. And you can do it across the universe. You can do it globally um, and understand what is the, the convergent brand that exists in people's minds. But the real, really interesting thing is that in the growth targets mind, the people you don't have, mm -hmm. very often negative associations get into the connectome. And that is what holds back growth. But if you're not working at the subconscious level to understand what those negative implicit associations are, they can be acting almost like a virus in, mm -hmm. in the mind and holding people back from converting. Because if you could spend $100 million on your growth target, if they have negative associations, those turn into barriers. And once mm -hmm. again, then you're going up against those barriers and they're not going to convert. So our whole approach at Triggers is let's take down, let's find out what your negative associations right. are, first of all. Let's monitor the unconscious mind of the growth target, the people you don't have, and let's make sure that our communications take down those negative associations 
so that uh, take down those barriers so that they come over. Yeah. Um, and how do, how do you uncover those negative associations? Because I feel like a lot of brands probably are not aware of them. That's exactly right. They're not because most brand trackers and uh, brand health uh, surveys, they only um, they only ask people conscious questions. And so they can only give you conscious answers. Mm -hmm. What we're doing is we're extracting memories. It's, it's a process called memory elicitation. And by extracting people's memories, you start to understand what's really in that unconscious mind. And that's what really drives choice. Um, th those unconscious barriers and drivers. Mm -hmm. uh, and if you've got I mean, there's a rule of thumb for the brand connectome. It comes down to three very simple things. You want your brand connectome to be large. This to make a healthy brand needs to be large. In other words, you need to have a large physical footprint with lots of connections. Two, you need to have a higher ratio of positive to negative associations. Negative mm -hmm. associations hold back growth. And then third, you want that distinctiveness or clarity. So large, positive, and distinctive. Those are the three rules for a successful brand. And you and you say uh, emotion. Uh, what's it? Emotional stories don't don't drive, uh, but memories do. So can you just because a lot of people would say, oh, okay, then I should beef up my case studies and my story because storytelling. A lot of people are talking about storytelling right now. Uh, so how do you how do you bridge that gap between uh, emotional stories and and memories? Um, it's a great question, and people are very confused about that. So thank you for giving me the opportunity to clarify. Um, emotions go in one ear and out the other. They do not stick in people's memories. So you, the way we want to think about emotion is it's the outcome. It's the effect that we want to have on the consumer or the customer. So let that be the takeaway. But what actually goes into memory structure are assets, verbal assets, visual assets, things that are really sticky. Mm. Um, distinctive brand assets are a great example of that. And we can talk about what some of those are in, in a moment. But we want to actually load the load people people's memories with these assets. Those are the things that actually remain. Um, and emotion, we should only think of as an outcome because you can't tell somebody how to feel. You can't mm -hmm. say you will love this brand. By the way, the minute you tell somebody you care about them, which is an emotion, they'll they'll know that you don't care about them at all. <laughs> or if you say, trust me, they will also know that not to trust this person. So we need to think of these emotions, care, trust, et cetera, as outcomes as opposed to inputs. Right, right, right. Yeah. So let's talk a little bit about those. What are what are some of the how does this manifest in a brand? Uh, well, what, we could take something like um, Aquafina bottled water, uh, okay. which is one of my favorite um, bottled waters. Um, Aquafina bottled water has a snow-capped mountain on its on the, on the front of its package. Snow-capped mountain um, is a wonderful trigger. So I call that a growth trigger because it's packed with positive associations that no one needs to say. You just look at that snow-capped mountain and your mind already has the narrative about that snow-capped mountain. Pure, pristine, eco-friendly, natural, uh, water from the glaciers, the purest, untouched by human hands, right? All of those are wonderful associations. So we love the snow-capped mountain because it's a really powerful category mm. trigger um, for purity um, in, the, in, the snow, in the bottled water category. For me to make that my own, I take that snow-capped mountain and I put a distinctive twist on it. I render it within this wonderful abstract design with a larger peak and a second peak and then a wonderful orange sunset next to it. And now I've basically branded the snow-capped mountain and made it distinctive to Aquafina bottled water. So Aquafina can ride all the existing neural pathways of all those positive associations but make them um, distinctive to to its brand. Does that make sense? Yeah, no, that that makes no, that makes absolute sense. And obviously, then we connect with something like that, and it it as you said, a memories. Maybe we have great memories of visiting the countryside or whatever. Or maybe we aspire to being able to go up mountains or whatever it is. But but it's as you said, triggering something. 
Right. So when I go to the, the shelf now and I look at my, my eye scans, the, 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 all the bottled waters on the shelf, I'm going to be drawn to that Aquafina bottled water before the other brands because it already exists in my mind. It's not mm-hmm. presenting something foreign. Yeah. And now it's a match between Aquafina and the, and the mountain I already have in my brain. Now, mm-hmm. instead of pushing people away, I'm drawing people toward my brand. Mm-hmm. And so that's really what's the most fascinating thing, that something that is familiar and meaningful and rendered in a distinctive way actually pulls you toward it. Um, and so it's not really so much about standing out, is mm-hmm. it? It's no. really much more about pulling you in yeah. um, and creating a match between what the brand is projecting and what you already have in your brain. Excellent. So let's highlight one more before we finish. Uh, Another example? Yes, please. uh, Of this in action. Okay. So let's take McDonald's. Mm -hmm. Um, McDonald's is a phenomenal brand, but about eight years ago, it was really struggling. Mm -hmm. There had been these awful videos that had gone viral in the marketplace showing... um, pink slime in your chicken nuggets and beef that doesn't mold and like 50 million views yeah. on these on these various videos. Very upsetting. You're, if you're the CMO, you're not sleeping very well yeah. um, at night. And they were losing a lot of customers as a result. Um, it turns out that all of that was uh, uh, a myth. None of that was true. But as you know, fake news can, <laughs> can get around. Yeah. Um, but they really had all their food was really real. It came from sustainable farms. They made the, the potatoes and all USDA brief, like all these good things. But nobody knew that story. And so by implementing a real food strategy and actually just bringing to light the things that they were already doing, they were able to remove those negative associations, which were holding back their growth. Um, by using a series of real food triggers. One of the most famous one was the fresh cracked egg. People had forgotten that McDonald's cooks in their restaurants. Mm -hmm. Starbucks doesn't. Um, Those eggs are just warmed up. Um, But when they make an egg McMuffin, it's made from scratch in the back. Um, And so this was really about, you know, reasserting and reestablishing these lost associations about real food and fresh cooking all day. Um, that McDonald's had always had, but had been kind of lost to a generation. Um, but they, but they brought it back by using these triggers and by developing um, this this real food strategy. It overwhelmed the negative associations practically immediately, and over time, the brand has built itself back up to be, you know, a force a force in the fast food industry with healthier food than ever. Absolutely. So, what um, before we go, what's one piece of advice you would give to any CMOs listening right now? Um, well, I guess the first piece of advice would be to read the book. Absolutely. And get, the, get the book for your organization. Look, um, you know, old habits die hard. Um, and but but the really the opportunity is that we are in the age of instinct. We now know that it, it is the instinct of mind that's calling the shots. Um, the age of instinct is what we're in because we we know that because of sure. Chat GBT. Um, everything is about instinct. I mean, the, 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 the way ChatGBT works is that it's connecting things. It's an, uh, cause it understands that the brain is an analogic machine. Mm-hmm. And so really the, the sooner that we start adopting these kinds of principles in all of our marketing work, um, the faster, um, all of these businesses will pick up and it's really the fast, easy way to drive, to drive change and, and drive choice. Absolutely. That's fantastic. Well, listen, all of Leslie's information is going to be below this video, including a link to the book. But before we go, please do tell people a little bit more about what you do. Um, well, Triggers is a brand consulting firm. Um, we, we've been around since 1995. Uh, we do all kinds of work for brands from um, insight work to brand positioning and uh, distinctive brand assets and distinctive brand triggers, which are just distinctive brand assets that have meaning and positive Mm -hmm. associations in them. Um, And I I think what we're known for is taking those really tough challenges that businesses have um, and helping them um, see uh, the the things that are hidden um, because you can't fix what you don't understand. 
Um, and so it's really about getting a better diagnosis. Um, and uh, yeah, we uh, still have all of the same excitement about what we do that I had 30 years ago um, and love every minute of it because every brand is a new challenge. Yeah. Um, and it's uh, when you find the unlock, then the, that brand can just take off. Yeah. I, and I would encourage everybody go check out the book again. It's called, uh, where we got it. It's called the, the power of instinct, the new rules of persuasion in business and life. There we have it. Uh, Leslie Zane, and you can learn all about that lovely sculptor 3d model behind, uh, behind Leslie there. And I would encourage you to go out and check it out. My goodness. I mean, you can, we're all bombarded today. You can tell there's a lot of money being spent on in, ineffective marketing. So, uh, invest in a book and you might actually uh, be able to buck the trend. All right. Well, listen, thanks again, Leslie. Thank you for watching, listening, and I will see you all again very soon. Thank you.